while we're here in the middle of winter, I'm guessing for most people, your garden is probably the last thing on your mind. However, it turns out there are a lot of really good reasons why you should be talking about the garden right now. And so I am delighted to have my dear friend and colleague, Katie Oglesby, who is the gardening expert that I go to when I have questions. She's here to tell us why we need to know for our winter gardens. First, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about her. So Katie is a certified health coach and a garden consultant. She offers garden-centered garden centered path in your health journey to becoming an empowered advocate for your own well-being. Gardening is truly a pathway to healing your body, clearing your mind, nourishing your soul, and loving your life. As a garden coach and real food advocate, Katie creates approachable, sustainable gardens to fuse the restorative power of gardening with the healing power of a food is medicine mindset to help you reach your garden to table lifestyle goals. So let's just dive in. Katie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Mira. And I love how you really do talk to people about gardening for all seasons. A garden is not just when it's spring and everything's flourishing. And that is true. I do think there's a lot of misconceptions in the gardening industry, especially in the northern states. And I'm in Wisconsin that we grow from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And that's really a myth. We can really push the seasons when we know what to grow and what seasons. And for those of you in the southern climate, you have a little bit better opportunity to grow through the winter months. And then there's other season extending options that we can use to really maximize our garden space. And it's so important, like you said, to think about where you're gardening, because I'm in Texas. And even though we had a week of killing frost, sub-zero temperatures, and a lot of things died. It was very depressing. My my winter vegetable garden is really, I'm delighted. My cabbages, my broccoli, all of that is doing really well. I even pulled two carrots out of the garden. <laughs> I was so excited. Yay! But our garden season is very different from yours, but there are still things that we need to do to prep the garden, to clean things up, to keep things going. And so what would be a really great task for people to be starting during this quiet time of the garden season? Yes. Yeah, so there's a couple things. So I'm just going to reference it as like garden hygiene, right? So sometimes oh, in the fall, we've had enough of the garden, winter blows in, we kind of abort mission a little bit. So making sure that we've cleaned out any of our dead plants, that we've removed any of the weeds, that we've really cleaned that out so it's not harboring anything in that gardening space. So you can compost your healthy plants, make sure you dispose of any diseased plants that you might've had in a separate area. And so cleaning the garden out is step one. Step two, I always recommend to top off with fresh compost. So you wanna start your next season in a fresh growing medium. Think about how those plants have already kind of exhausted some of those nutrients that were in your existing soil. So you want to start off on the best foot, right, that we have. So we're going to top off those gardens with some fresh compost. And it's okay to let it sit all winter. It'll work its way into the soil. So that's a good thing to start off with, particularly you never know if we're going to have a rainy spring season or growing season. So getting some of these things out of the way, even in winter, really allows us to get our momentum going in the spring. And so a few other things that I like to recommend is to go through all your gardening tools and sanitize them. Like we think maybe because they've just been sitting there, they're fine. And they're not as part of like garden hygiene. We don't want to be spreading anything that we may have had last year. So you can take some wipes. I have a spray bottle of rubbing alcohol. And so I'll go through and just clean up all my tools, make sure everything's ready for spring, do a little housekeeping in my garden bag or your garden, little tool shed. And make sure all of those things are cleaned up and ready to go. That is actually such a great idea. I did not think about, I normally wait until all of a sudden I need my garden tools. And it's, oh man, these have dirt all over them and I'm sitting there scrubbing them. So to do it now before I need them is actually a really good idea. And I also love your suggestion to compost now because I can tell, obviously being down here, my raised vegetable beds took a huge hit during the summer because it's so hot and so dry. And 
as you had recommended that I put in some Oyas and I can tell by looking at them, man, that soil got really low. It just sank. And so I can top it back up to the top of that level. That's a really good way for me to measure that. Yeah. You will notice settling of your, which is a good point. We always want to bring that up a little bit and add the fresh compost. So that's a really good, and you're, it's a good observation that you're noticing those things. So it is like a like the top recommendation I have to make sure we're starting out with really good. You want those plants to be as nutrient dense as possible. So making sure that we're giving providing those plants with that foundation is important. So I have a question for you, and this is like for my personal garden, I'll be honest. I grow tomatoes in containers just because it's easiest down here. If I put them in the ground, I can't move them if they start getting too much sun or whatever. But I left them in the pot. And so it's looking pretty horrible. Do I just dump the whole thing now or is it too late and I should just wait and refill it in the spring? You can dump it now. You can dump it now. Pull it, pull it out. Start with some fresh growing medium. A lot of times we talk about crop rotation is important, right? But that's not always feasible, especially in small gardens. So adding some fresh medium or starting with some fresh soil would be good. So getting that ready, I think would be a great idea. Okay, good to know. Now, one of the other questions I know, typically a lot of people, and I'm one of them, I've learned to get a little bit better from knowing you, don't really plan ahead. And so then all of a sudden what happens is the start of growing season, you go to the hardware store or whatever, and you go, ooh, plants, <laughs> and you just so what is the best time to start looking at planning? And especially if you want to do things from seed, by the time you see them at the hardware store, it's too late to start those seeds. Yeah, so that's a great question. So at the end of each season or the beginning, so like just for example, in January is a great time. What is your garden vision is one of the topics I've been talking mm -hmm. about lately. So let's do an evaluation. Let's take a few minutes and think about what were our wins from last year? What were our possible misses, whether they were our fault or mother nature? What did you enjoy? What did you want more of? What did your family eat a lot of? Really taking some notes, just a reflection time on what that was. And that. do you have a health goal? Have you been advised to eat more of something? And can you incorporate that into your garden? So setting the tone, doing some reflection. And then what I like to tell people is, Make a list of all the things you want to grow is step one. Step two, separating it by things you're going to start by seed and things that you need to purchase by plant. Because like you said, you'll go to the greenhouse and it's like, yes, all these plants and the cart's full and you got more plants probably than I'm guilty of it than what I need. So really making that list. So if tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, those are typical plants that we would buy from the greenhouse that you wouldn't start by seed in your garden. You wouldn't directly mm -hmm. sow them, right? So you're going to separate those lists. If you aren't into seed starting, it's a good indication of, I'm going to buy all my green seeds, my carrots, my salad garden seeds, but I know I need to buy you know, my tomatoes, peppers, my herb plants, things like that, that don't go well. So making two separate lists because your seeds are something that you can order now and you can get that organized. So I recommend organizing last year's seeds, making a list of what you need to purchase because we are seeing an influx in gardening and, and some varieties are being sold out. So we want to be proactive. We want to get our seed orders in any potato plants you want to order, anything like that, certain varieties for your climate. So that's why I recommend really ordering in January and February, getting all those things that you need. And then you have your to-do list when that greenhouse opens, you can get exactly what you need to get when it comes planting season. And I love that you're suggesting that taking that reflective time, which of course also means keeping a garden journal so that you can look, because it's That's hard sometimes. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's the next thing. It's hard sometimes to look back and go, gee, what was I doing six months ago? But I've learned from that, that no matter how much I love dill and no matter how much I want to grow it, the black swallowtails just clean me out every year. It's not worth growing dill because it won't survive in my garden. Luckily, that means we have more butterflies, which is great. But it's such a larval food for them. And it wasn't until I started looking back through three years in a row, no dill, duh. Why, why am I still yeah. holding it? 
And that's a good thing is like keeping a garden journal. I was looking back. I admittedly was very poor at that in the beginning years. And I look back at some of these spirals that I had and I was like, oh gosh, but it is important. We think we're going to remember. And then we don't like, you're like, you have this aha moment of that was not a good use of my real estate, right? Like, especially if you have small spaces, you're yeah. that's something I'm going to purchase or buy from a local farmer's market but I'm going to add more of this because this did very well for me. So really thinking through in that reflection time, taking the time to document your season can be super helpful for the next season. Yeah. And I also really like that you talk about planning what you and your family will eat. Can you talk a little bit more about your garden to table philosophy? Yes. So there's a, there's a few things that I think are important that a lot of times we'll just be like, Oh, I'm going to do the staples, the zucchini, the tomatoes, and those things that we see that everybody grows. Right. But if you don't enjoy them, you're not going to eat them. Mm -hmm. I also think on the flip side, when we grow it, we have a tendency to eat it more, including children and families in this lifestyle. So vegetables are a tough one sometimes for kiddos but they do seem to want to at least try them if they've taken the time to grow them. So really thinking through what your family eats on a regular basis, having the kids each pick their favorite vegetable, right? Getting them involved. So then when they go to harvest, there's more skin in the game when you could bring it into the kitchen. You know, you want, that's the twofold of this is we love to garden. I love to be outside, but really using it as our fuel and making sure we're maximizing what we're growing by bringing into the kitchen, which is a whole nother, I would say bonding or family experience, right? You can experience it outside together, but then you can also bring it to the table and experiment in the kitchen and involve your family and friends with new herbs and new flavors. And so I think that is really bringing that experience to light is making sure we're balancing both sides, which documenting it, picking out your favorite recipes. I tell families, pick out the top five recipes you eat and what ingredients can you grow out of those, right? Let's really dig in and try to engage everybody, you know, as a whole in your household. And I think one of the other things that I really love about that, for example, when my grandson comes to visit, I really love the idea. And we have done this a number of times we go outside and we pick things and I'm teaching him how to pick them responsibly. So he's not damaging the plant. And I love, he's like smelling his hands because the mint is so fragrant or the onions are so sharp. And that really is just a very fun way to connect with them and help them develop a deeper appreciation. He loves food, so he's really into that. He likes helping me in the kitchen, but it's really fun to be able to add that other dimension to what's going on. Yeah, I think kids, and that's a great experience for you, I think, as a grandma. And then also like you're educating, where does our food come from and how it grows and how you sustainably harvest it? And all those things are great foundational pieces that can really benefit our next generation. So it's just, it's a really fun trick. One other thing I do talk about if families are struggling to get their kids to eat more vegetables is each color of the rainbow, like how many make it a game? Like you're going to eat three reds, five oranges, two yellows a week and really get them involved. <laughs> and it's a good way to encourage eating that diversity of color and flavors and vegetables and fruits. And that's actually a really great suggestion because it also hopefully encourages the families to plant more colors in the garden. I know this year I tried eggplant for the first time and it was great, but I think I started too late because I got one crop and then I got flowers for a second crop, but then we got this horrible heat wave. And so they, they just fell off the plant. It was very oh, no. sad. It was those three eggplant that we got were super delicious. We loved that. So that's always a fun thing to do. Is there any specific tip that you have for helping people keep track of all of that? Is there some kind of a workbook or a journal that you recommend for them? 
I do. I, a few things. So I did create, I created a guidebook just to help my clients walk you through this garden to table lifestyle. So that is an option. There's a lot of other homesteader type workbooks out there. But one of the things is first of all, walking through your season, Mm -hmm. taking like a journal, as far as documenting every month, your first and last frost date and working from there. So you can lay out your plants as you go through the season. So you're a little bit more organized and intentional when you go to plant. You're like, okay, it's cool season. You know what temperatures April are in April and I can start planting these things. You know, as we transition to warm season, then I can add these plants. So it's a good little tracking system to, to work through. And you can, if you don't want to buy anything, you can just go through and do a quick Google search. Like what are my average temperatures for each month of the year? And it gives you a little bit of an indication of what plants that you can plant as you work through that. So that also helps with like your organizing and maximizing your season and hopefully making it a little bit more successful. Yeah. And I love, I think your guidebook sounds like a great idea because then you have it all in one place. It's very convenient to find. I tend to have a lot of pieces of paper all over the place. So we'll have to talk about that. (laughs) We'll talk about that. Katie, this has been great. You have just shared so much wonderful information and some great advice for people to begin a healthy, focused, successful garden year up ahead. If they wanted to learn more from you or connect with you, how would they find you? So you can find me at katieoglesby.com. I'm also on Instagram at Katie M. Oglesby, and I send out a bi-monthly newsletter with some extra tips and tricks. So look forward to connecting with everyone. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I'm sure that everybody listening is hopefully taking lots of great notes and learning what they can do and why we need to be thinking about the garden in the winter. Folks, I will put all of the links down below so that you can connect with Katie and learn from her all the things that she is recommending. Please remember to subscribe so you stay connected as we do more videos and more interviews in the coming months. So Katie, thanks so much for being here. Take care. Take care. Thank you, Mira.